Hello everyone, welcome to the 11th Chebcast. Today we're discussing necromancy spells, magic and rituals. And we're here with 7th Outpost. Hello there. Uh, it's Ghost UK. Hello. So hi for hentai. What is up? And I cannot stress this enough. <laughs> my gamers. And we've got a special guest today. We've got Mr. Spook. Hello. I invited Mr. Spook on because he's written some very interesting things in world building. I figure why not talk to him about it. So we'll, we'll kick this off by hearing about what Seventh has to say because he's got quite an interesting setting. So um, I think first and foremost, I decided to take a look at magic in general and what ideas I believe would be good to enhance it for either your setting for a story or for RPG, etc., etc. Um, so I think that magic should be part of either some philosophy or or some like like uh, some hierarchy of logic. Uh, or, or, or some cosmology that manifests itself on different levels of reality. So just like you have concepts, in a way, clashing uh, in the real world, in alchemy and philosophy, so should magic have this kind of um, themed, in my opinion, uh, approach to, 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 to how it works. So, for example, you know, if, if something is is hot then you know it, it may have like an, an association with anger etc etc uh, or or things that are cold um can have association with like with like uh cold calculation and and like cold approach to things um that is i i, I will i will uh, let, let's say elaborate on on what i mean by that in in my own let's say portion of how i i have actually implied this uh sorry implemented this but um so another principle that i believe is very useful is that magic should draw from the world from real things that are out there in the world instead of just things that are uh i would say in our heads you know so so there is a lot of systems that rely solely on let's say just drawing mana from the ether something like that right there's plenty of systems like that i i say try to not do that right there's, i know there's there's plenty of like D D like systems and all that what I, what I believe is it's better to enclose magic in specific things. Maybe there are places of power, like in Witcher. Maybe there's actual magical ingredients that you need to uh, combine somehow. And, or maybe the ingredients themselves are mundane, but uh, the way you connect them is makes the magic happen somehow right make the the magic inherent in the world rather than just something that manifests itself because the program in the the form of a spell is run specifically um so what stems from that is symbolically charged rituals uh so, and, and of course, if you're writing a story, then you may want to explain why the, the ritual is the way it works, right? So let's say that iron, uh, especially cold iron, may symbolize uh, like coldness, civilization, etc. Uh, and so it hurts the elves who are... Um, who are like magical creatures you know so it's so it's like or 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 cold steel on armor can shield one from fey magic because it's their antithesis uh it's their antithesis antithesis yeah that's antithesis. a hard word that one that's a that's a hard word antithesis uh, non-native yeah antithesis yes uh the the, the point is to get, like have logic dictate what magic does and i mean like 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 philosophical principles because that way 
you will not only be able to explain things better to your player or your reader, you will also be able to yourself come up with things that seem more in line with the world, you know? And, and I think it will be way more fun to think about the clashing of, of concepts on like, mat sorry, like material manifestations of concepts, etc., uh, as your magic system. Yeah, that's it found really it way more satisfying and, and interesting to see systems working like that. I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned emotion. So yeah. would that mean like getting really angry would improve a spell potentially? Yeah. That's exactly what I mean. So, like, like get, being like very, very angry improves like a fire spell, right? So you're you're very angry, so your emotions are fiery, you know, that sort of. Stuff. Or, or maybe maybe you um maybe you are like very cold as a person yourself. So frost spells are empowered, and and of course that is the most like basic way of looking at things, you know. There's there's um that's the most most basic interpretation. I will get a bit more in depth into what i did with that but i i think this like basic like oh well emotions can influence your spell casting that's that's a very good start god i've just thought of that now i've just i've just i've just imagine the villain is there like just top top tier edge lord type he's going aha the power of friendship can't save you now and the, and the main character just goes friendship fuck that i've got jack daniels downs the lot of it, it get it turns into a drunken rage and just like vomits out a great torrent of fire from his mouth <laughs> at, at um, the villain so what, what i meant is m more let's say that you're running a game right and right. your your um your big bad evil guy uh depends on the ice magic right your your party learns this somewhere well they know that ice magic requires great let's say concentration and like cold emotions what if they specifically uh, find ways to rile him up? They find his, you know, hidden uh, hidden secrets. They find his uh, childhood trauma things, and they rile him up to the point where he can't use his his special magic anymore. Oh my god, you know? that's such a good idea, man. So what would necromancy yep. be then? Because when it comes to emotions and shit like that, typically like with um, DC, for example. I, I, okay, maybe, okay. Like, in, like, in... Uh, like with, with DC, like they tend to sort of make it kind of simplistic in a sense. It's like, oh yeah, we've got green for willpower. We've got blue for hope. We've got orange for greed. Okay, we've got okay, red for rage. Okay. Let's, let's, let's go a bit further. Let me describe how I do things in my world. Right. So, um, mag so, so if you want to animate something, you need like a uh, motive force behind it right so that motive force needs to be to have like soul like structure a soul is something that is like ethereal it's like a spirit that is made to inhabit inside a a vessel out of ma matter it can be it can be let, let's say a spirit inhabiting a suit of armor it can be a uh, a spell so like an artificial soul made to inhabit a corpse so in in that particular case we have we have um arcane necromancy so like in, in one of the the options of 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 necromancy in my world is by producing and potentially improving like an artificial soul inside an arcane crystal so like there's the tide of the world it's like there are arcane crystals out there you can either mine them you can buy them etc and then with your training you uh you inscribe the spell for animation so like this artificial soul into them and then uh you know you you you, you let's say you you embed them inside the the undead or you just use them to raise the undead to manifest the soul temporarily over an un, un, undead so it can animate it and then based on the quality of the soul you know the undead is going to be faster or stronger more intelligent etc uh, so you may want to let's say venture out into ruins find some pre uh pre-flood civilization that animated things way 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 better than ours does 
and and steal the artificial souls that they built from them or or uh, option three you can have uh, a spirit in the wilderness that has no let's say body of its own right it, it just has like a like a spiritual thing going for it and you can either like bind it or make a pact with it and it's going to serve you so you're like okay well here's a corpse you know and it just goes right back in and um well what if your what if your contract runs out with a demon you know what if uh, what if it stops liking you what if it finds a better master all kinds of questions that you got to answer yourself as you uh deal and dabble in necromancy in this world i really like the idea of hate fueling necromancy somehow um yeah you can have so what you can do is you can have a spirit that is some spirits are born out of emotions right um some spirits are born out of like dying like last dying emotions of adventurers who venture into the wild some of them are hatred obviously etc but, but let's say they venture out into the wild and the adventurer gets killed right now usually his soul does not linger in the world but what does linger is his anger is his um is his greed at what he couldn't achieve so all this lingers and it can be animated um somehow you know and and, and uh, you have a spirit and that spirit can get, then go right back into that body and animate it with a bit of a bit of a you know more simplistic approach to life going like give me give me give me give me you know or or i want to destroy everything you know yeah i really like your ideas i'm definitely going to have to incorporate some of this into my world yep uh and obviously i think it, it's it's great to see more let's say uh differing spellcraft than just animation itself for example like curses so you are uh you take usually like like with voodoo dolls you would take somebody somebody's essence so it's usually like like the the um hair clippings the nail uh nail pieces cut off etc etc maybe even a piece of, of the their flesh or something like that so something a piece of their essence and you put it inside a doll and then you torture them or you lay a curse on them or or you you call forth a disease etc etc yeah yeah so all kinds of uh let's say things like that does anyone have any questions for the seventh um not really how i mean mm how would this interact with the world like when it comes to wildlife uh, fauna flora when it comes to the what's underground when it comes to uh, natural geography when it comes to you know like um will this affect where places will be set up or this affect how people interact with each other how politics is done so on and so forth yeah i mean i mean obviously like like if um if magic is in your world let's say if in, in my world um the sun has like anti-magic properties and most if not all of civilization that has held itself together worships the sun essentially mm. so they worship anti-magic so they will inevitably have uh just raw measures of anti-magic in place in the form of wards in the form of consecrate consecrated flames that either chase spirits away to the point where every um because men are kind of like blessed by the sun i mean humans in general so every fire started by them is going to chase spirits away just like by birth un un unless they somehow they somehow fall uh from their their the blessing of the sun uh all, all every fire they start every every um action they take to invoke the warmth and light that the sun gives them or like little images of it like like you know flames torches bonfires uh all of this is going to have meaning um and and impact so what i ask myself is like what it means what it means in my world 
and what it means di dictates what it does. Sounds great, man. We've lost Mr. Spook. I hope he comes back. Yeah, I just uh, I, know, I, I saw that and I thought to myself, hmm, where's he gone? Probably a disconnect. Probably. I think uh, we can proceed to you, Cheb, instead while we wait for him, yo. All right, that sounds like a good idea. So after hearing all of your great ideas, Seventh, I think I'm going to have to incorporate some of that into my world somehow. But I'll just describe how it is right now. Can I just say, like, in keeping with the theme of necromancy, we can easily just kill each other's ideas and reanimate them and put them for purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in my universe, necromancy is like a natural phenomenon in that it occurs when spirits seek to re-enter the world and possess corpses to re-experience life. Like, they have different motivations for that. Sometimes they're bored. Sometimes they have unfinished business, that type of thing. And, and these spirits that come back and possess like random corpses, these are the wild undead. And they basically feel all of the wounds of the, of, of the corpse. And this sends them crazy because they're in constant agony. And this is why wild undead are feared because they're very unpredictable and often violent because of all the agony that they're experiencing. And um, what a necromancer can do is a necromancer can artificially make this process happen. And they can do that by binding a spirit to a corpse either with its consent or without its consent. And I've, I've made this the, um, the possibility because I want to somehow facilitate both good and evil necromancers existing. Uh, just, just quick, quick uh, question. Sure. I assume spirits are souls, like human souls. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay. I, I had a bit wider, um, let's say, description of that. Like w w when I said spirits, I meant like also wisps, phantoms, animated emotions, animated concepts, etc. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm just that. explaining that. So in my world, yeah. the spirit is any, anything that's conscious, like aware of itself, has a spirit. And when it dies, it goes to the spirit realm. So like, um, this means mostly animals, maybe a sentient tree would have a spirit, but something like a virus mm -hmm. that's just a single cell organism would not have a spirit. Uh, the virus does not have cells, but bacteria yeah. do. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> I'm no expert on that stuff. But uh, yeah, so a necromancer can put a spirit into a corpse. It can either ask them to come back like if they want to and this would be the good approach or they can force the spirit back in there and the this would be the evil approach and necromancers have control over the the agony that the spirit experiences so they're in full control over whether the spirit feels nothing from the dead corpse or they're in complete agony like they would be if they were a, a wild undead and this is how evil necromancers basically blackmail spirits into service when they don't want to serve the mm -hmm. necromancer. Um, when it comes to ghosts, basically ghosts are spirits that do not want to move on for some reason. And when a spirit does not want to move on, it manifests as like a haunting. And usually there's some physical kind of anchor keeping the spirit there like maybe their corpse or something of sentimental value like a ring like a wedding ring or something like that and necromancers can create artificial hauntings which is like a pretty evil practice because it because a, a ghost is in like some kind of grief because it doesn't stay because it wants to it feels like it has to so a necromancer can create an artificial haunting with a piece of flesh from the deceased or something they really care about like a wedding ring and then the spirit is basically a slave to the necromancer as a ghost minion and when the ghost is by in, when the ghost is bound in this way it's essentially torn from its afterlife which is another reason why it's evil and the final thing about necromancers in my setting i'd like to mention is that they're 
manipulators of positive and negative energies. And I call this holy and unholy. And basically, positive energies strengthen the connection between the spirit and its body, and negative ones serve to separate this and unravel that bond. So that's pretty much my setting. Anyone got any questions or anything? When it comes to, what's the public opinion when it comes to necromancy? Like the general consensus? Probably more people are against it than for it, but there are certain societies of gray necromancers which um, see its value. For example, a civilization might employ necromancers to work in mines because they'd rather lose dead than, uh, than actual people. And then, of course, there's just the, the batshit evil ones that do their own crazy shit and give them all a very bad reputation. Mm. I guess if there's no further questions, we can move on to Mr. Spook's setting. Mm -hmm. um, with the setting I have, like with Seventh, um, it has a lot to do with how magic works as a whole in it. In this magic system, magic is more of a force, fundamentally, kind of like how we have of the electromagnetic force and gravity in our world, so too does magic work like that. So it has grown more organically, kind of like a science has, where instead of hard schools, you'll see overlap in magic. You'll see the influences of nature magic and quite a lot of what is considered a vitality magic of life, because as a necromancer, you know a lot about bodies and the vitality of a living being, which would bring about what in my world, these are called necromatic energy or necrovita, which necrovita is the combination of vitality and necrotic energy, a death energy, leading to undeath. And that's something you'll see in the undead when created. As well as that, with main necromancers, because there's necromages and necromancers in my setting in necromancy, with necromancers, they're focused on mainly necrovita and necromatic energy to create and manipulate undead. That is their focus. And that's basically how like someone hardcore into a school would be. That's how you get the Mancer title. As well, then necromages are people who have used necromatic energy to enhance other spells. Mana in the setting has attributes if there's a lot of influence in something. Say, a graveyard has had a lot of death in it. Slowly, the mana in that area would have that necromatic attribute. And using that mana, you can augment different spells. So an ice spell would usually be like, free someone. But with necromancy, you could make it even colder and have the effect of kind of like the cold of the afterlife or fire, a fire that will go out as it's consuming the power of death. And that'd be something like necro fire. Sounds awesome. And thus as the attributes, the secondary reason necromancers have a lot of interest in Vita as well is by using a lot of necromatic energy as a necromancer is harmful to you because you are a living being and it will build up with you in you and if you don't work with the vita you will slowly turn more and more gaunt until you may actually turn into an undead yourself or just die hmm. which is seen as something that's not preferable because it's not a very strong undead you'll probably become a ghoul so i guess that means there's no I, I i think that's a, that's a very very um logical that uh, it wouldn't be preferable to die um <laughs> Yeah, I, I fully agree with your idea of, of uh, the world. It's a shame um, that we had this, this brief lapse uh, in, in, in um, function. Um, but long story short, yeah, I fully agree with the idea of like having um, magic be principles. So like if you engage with the principle of death, then you will inevitably be tainted with it, you know? Uh, or that the magic that is inside a place of death, like graveyard, will be inevitably like uh, 
tainted with or or just you know it will have the aspect of death so like if you want to draw on death you have to go to a graveyard if you want to draw on life you go somewhere else etc etc uh what about good necromancers i guess they can't exist in such a setting actually necromancers are inherently non-evil so in this setting it's not so much as like oh death energy is bad it's just another part of the energy spectrum because when you cast magic every person in them every everything in this world with some exceptions due to other things in my setting inherently have mana within them because of that fundamental force and it will build up and that's how casters are made like it's the continued use will cause mana to so first be a vapor, then become like a liquid in you, and then crystallize. And thus, each magical beast has crystals in them, so will mages. And this mana has no attributes to it. The more you cast in something, or if you're around something of that, you gain the attributes. And thus, necromancy isn't seen as evil, because there's white and black and gray necromancy. White and gray usually make deals with spirits. Like, they'll call from the veil and ask, will you make a contract with me or you take a dead body and when you animate it you don't need a soul to do so you can just there's multiple methods that'd be kind of too long to get into just for this podcast because i could probably fill up an hour talking about it but <laughs> it it's there is one school who could add spirits to make an undead living again as an unlife but even then that is usually done with the consent of the spirit so necromancy isn't seen as evil there are people who follow like a darker path that enslave spirits and do the more unscrupulous parts but magic is seen as like a tool like necromancy is seen as a tool as any other magic would and not inherently evil that sounds good kind of like similar to my setting how the, the good necromancers ask for permission and the bad ones just sort of drag the spirit in there. And then finally, I kind of want to talk with the rituals thing. So while ritual is like a whole over school of magic, kind of like not just necromancy related, there are quite a few necromancy rituals. And the benefit of rituals in my setting are they take a lot of setup and they're much slower to do than a conventional spell would. But they have the benefits of you can have multiple casters work on something to have something have a much stronger effect. You don't have to be as proficient in magic to do rituals. And they're much more stable and can last longer than most spells as to why someone would actually use them. That sounds great. I really like that of, idea. Of course, as well, there's risk involved with doing rituals, though, as because they have um rituals function a lot with uh some of the uh what's the word for it the principles on how it's done so if you mess up a ritual you might accidentally cast a different one or mess it up to where something bad can happen to you so if you mess up say a high power ritual you very well could kill yourself if you mess up the wrong part and even for low-powered ones, if you continue to go with a ritual that's already gone wrong, it can have disastrous effects, such as, like, if you're summoning a spirit and you're trying to get a specific one and you mess up somewhere in it and it doesn't just fail, you can end up calling a malicious spirit that could try and trick you and be freed and then hurt you and kind of deal with that. Very cool. I like it a lot. And then just for necromancy as itself, the necrotic energy, often it's a more broad sense of the magic. So life extension by preventing death can be seen as a form of necromancy as you're controlling the uh, energy of death in someone. As well as consuming life, it would be considered a necromatic kind of magic by like draining the vita of someone else and replacing theirs with like death energy or just taking their vita does death energy function like poison to living beings let's say i assume that it would deal more damage to like drain the vita and then replace it with the necrotic 
energy. It would work not like a poison, but kind of a necrosis. As you drained, you would slowly kill cells, and if you put in enough, you would cause someone's like cells to die and go into necrosis. So it'd be more like direct killing things, and I, I guess kind of like how a poison would work, but it's more direct than that. No, no, no. I, I mean, like, I assume that both draining and then filling uh, with necrotic, with, with the, with the, yeah, with the, with the necro energy, uh, would deal more damage than just draining. Yes, because when you just drain, it doesn't like kill the cells outright or like whatever yeah. you're doing, right? But then filling it with necrotic energy when it's empty would just kill the cells outright. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that sounds pretty cool. But when infused in someone who already has like a lot of life energy in them, you might get it to start like transforming the Vita into like Necrovita, which is more of an unlife state. So draining then filling would have a much different effect than just filling someone with necrotic energy. Uh, in my setting, you actually see this with some magical diseases. That's how vampirism happens. It's a disease with a lot of necrotic attribute that was magically created that will slowly convert um, a living being into a vampiric undead as they need to consume the blood for Vita to keep themselves going. Yeah, yeah, this is cool. Um, I have like vampires uh, in my setting. Essentially what defines a human is an inner warmth and well mostly that right like an inner warmth and an inner in a way purity uh that blood kind of like courses through their veins and, and purifies them so in order to become a vampire one has to either through disease but more often through uh through willing action uh in a way like like forfeit their own warmth and in return, they will always hunger for it. So they have to drain the uh, the blood inside a human being or eat the flesh in the case of werewolves, etc., etc. For mine, like I, I mentioned the disease, but vampires and other like monsters like lycanthropes can appear for other methods like a curse or yeah. Yeah, intentional yeah. creation of it. But yeah, for, for the vampires in my setting, the reason they drink blood is solely because the life energy is very prevalent in blood. So it's the most efficient way to drain Vita to continue to exist as they are. Because if they let themselves not drink blood, they'll kind of uh, morph and think of it more as North Nosferatu vampires is solely what they'll start to look like as opposed to a vampire that looks completely human. So not drinking will slowly turn them into that, and then drinking again will start to help them recover. Um, would it be possible to give them a Vita from all the sources? Yes. Um, it wouldn't be as efficient for most, but there are some who can just drain it directly, but that'd be more powerful vampires. But I, I mean, like... What about um, getting the Vita from animals or from, like, maybe there are life springs or something? Like, can you rehabilitate a vampire in your setting? Oh, vampires don't need to drink human blood. Animal blood works fine. As mm -hmm. for Ares with large Vita, a vampire living there, yes, could. But it's not preferable because... Due to the fact they absorb Vita, they can actually hurt the spring source there if they continue mm -hmm. to eat off of it. Okay, okay. Cool. Um, yeah, because they're, they're all filled with, with the necrotic. Okay, okay. Well, it's more the disease in them is eating yeah. away at their Vita. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and they could, like, um, spread or taint the spring with a disease, right? Um, they couldn't taint the spring, but if it's a disease variant, they could indeed infect others if they gave their own blood to them. Mm -hmm. But the other message would be like methods like if you curse someone to it, you could also create a vampire that way if you're a vampire. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This sounds pretty cool. 
I got a question about the spring. So, um, yeah. What is it and like, how can it exist? Cause I'm kind of imagining like blood seeping so off the floor. It, I was going with this. I, there's no like direct springs in my setting. I was just kind of like explaining kind of like that. There are magical, like in, in theory springs, but that'd be like a graveyards, a spring for necrotic energy. One for life energy might be somewhere where like a lot of life blooms. Maybe nature mage made like a very specific garden that was meant to focus in the energy. Or maybe you're near a giant, uh, they're called world trees, which are trees that have absorbed a lot of mana and now exude it around them and will create large groves around them. Hmm. Okay. Makes sense. Because it's more a focusing of the mana with the attribute because mana exists everywhere just inherently it's just there are points that have like it more focused in a location i think and then have an attribute added i think it was you that once said and correct me if i'm mistaken that like liches are kind of like not such a great option compared to some other thing was that you yeah i think i think being a lich is kind of a terrible undead so like what what do you have in store? Like, do you have a better alternative in your setting? Um, for being immortal, it's kind of like necromancy is one school where it can be found. There's people who would argue in the world that necromancy is the best because it is easy to become undying as an undead. Like, in the fact that, like, if you become a lich, you will never age, and as long as your phylactery isn't destroyed. Of course, there's more powerful liches who actually make their phylactery split into multiple pieces, so you have to destroy multiple pieces of phylactery. But even in necromancy, there are ways where you can make yourself basically a spirit who can possess people, but you still threaten being trapped, and there's a way to... Uh, change the cycle of so-called reincarnation to force your spirit from out of the afterlife into a new body to be reborn with your memories. Because consciousness inherently imprints on the soul and in reincarnation, it's usually like wiped away as it begins a new life. But necromancy can allow you to keep that through a cycle of life. And how would you destroy such a necromancer that's like in that kind of state? You'd have to destroy its consciousness and basically cause it to be wiped completely, forcing it as a new soul, like basically a new reincarnation cycle where they don't remember who they are, which fundamentally kills the old them. Very interesting stuff. Any other questions or should we move on to ghosts setting? I think we can move on. All right, good. I'm trying to think of a way to begin, because quite a bit of it is still subject to change. Um, okay, so necromancy is definitely a thing in the world. It's uh, one of the four major um, magical areas on this continent where humans are. Um, there is the risk of a magic, but necromancy is more kind of a northern sort of thing. The reason they're able to do necromancy is because they have an artifact which allows them to do it, pretty much. It acts as a catalyst um, to allow them to do it. Nobody knows fully where magic comes from, but they have theories to where it comes from. And they believe, like, uh, ne alchemists believe they draw power from the universal soul. Necromancers believe they draw power from the dead, spirits, ghosts. Um, the... What what pe when people die and what they turn into, it's they believe that they draw power from that. Um, so they're quite kind of chill with it. Now, when it comes to how like uh, when it comes to undead, when it comes to vampires, when it comes to liches and all of that, there is no singular thing that fully determines what one can and cannot be when it comes to undead. All of it is arbitrary and. The reason why it is like that is because of uh, the thing that which controls that. So necromancers are not 
a majorly common common occurrence they are typically you'll find that most of most of them will be from people uh, families or groups or individuals that will have the ability the fi uh, the financial support the uh, political backing all of that to be able to go into doing these kind of areas because uh, it will it will give them power and it will also give their families power in the uh, groups that they're with power you will get rogue ones that will do their own thing but these ones will either be not as good as established ones or they will be going in completely different directions because they're doing it all by themselves and this can cause both good things and bad things you, in saying that though you will have um like some of them you will have uh, rogue ones that will effectively advance things further like the first lich came from uh, what was a rogue necromancer so uh, when it comes to necromancy itself you have your typical kind of things with it as in you have your typical magic you've um of raising the dead and whatnot when a necromancer dies the undead will remain typically um you will find rogue undead that are wandering about doing their own thing but, and this and if they're they've got nothing with them or if they've if they're wandering alone by themselves and whatnot this will most likely most likely be because that their master is dead and they've got no clue what they're fucking doing when it comes to ghosts you can find ghosts uh, doing their own thing and most of the time they will stay in areas which keeps them lingering if somebody dies and they cannot move on then they will stay because of the thing that is keeping them from moving on most of the time they just need the talking to to realize what they're lacking or what they've always wanted to do in life and then they will spend their on death achieving that goal so say for example that somebody wants to explore the world well do it you're undead you can't fucking die again can you you can't uh, starve you can't drown just do what you want to do which does cause problems when other people see wandering ghosts out in the in the wild and it freaks them out <laughs> yeah i imagine uh, when it comes to the special and dead, like vampires, liches, um, like uh, souls in armor, so on and so forth, uh, necromancers um, are essentially death uh, worshippers. They worship death. Death is not an inherent. It's not a character, and at the same time, it is. It's not got a physical body. It's not got. It's more of an ab abstract concept which has personification added on to it so their relationship with, with death is that death is neither good nor bad death supports everyone's armies and at the same time does nothing to actually support those armies if you know what i mean as in if everyone's going to die death will be there casually waiting and at the same time death won't do anything to stop or help it will just wait death is death um, but they see death as having a brilliant sense of humor and so when it comes to necromancers uh, they do get reformed um after a, a big coup is led against a mentally insane king as you do <laughs> so they do uh, face reformation and with this reformation they are changed to uh, be not only necromancers but they do medical stuff on top of that and this is uh, more it's more to do with the fact that because they do necromancy they don't have a big access to healing magic healing magic is like you can potentially heal with alchemy but you need to have the medical training to effectively do that to edit the organs to change the body in a way to allow for that to happen same with other stuff like you can you can't heal with arcane but you can create you can conjure the tools to help you do surgery um so on and so forth so when it comes to necromancy uh because they lack the ability to properly heal heal people um they have instead of focus more on that kind of medicinal area though some of them are able to kind of get better at doing healing sh healing stuff like uh one person for example in order to save his wife who is suffering act uh, actually curses her to prolong her life so that she's suffering for longer negatively but it also keeps her alive so he can keep finding a cure for her that's a cool idea so and so on and so forth um they have curses and curses are a dying area to go into there is only uh one character i have that effectively or technically two but one's a dragon 
uh, once a, a human who does curses, and that's because he's been trained and educated to do that. The dragon who does curses is able to do them because dragons are able to do anything ma magical that they want. They, because they are beyond human intelligence in that regard and beyond human understanding in that regard, mentally and spiritually, like if they want to do a specific kind of thing that's magical, that's not religion based, they can do it, more or less. And they can do, they can have a lot of leeway when it comes to other stuff as well. But that's, but that's purely because of how they were created and what they were made for. Um, rituals are typically across uh, across all of them. Um, Alchemy is different because they've got transportation circles, which are technically rituals, but they just kind of change it because they're special. As in, as in, not special as in, oh, it's unique, special as, well, technically, but special as in uh, that one kid in the back of the class who has got a rubber in his, in his nose, like that kind of special. Okay. Um, rituals do what casters cannot do. So if you have a person trying to do something too complicated and it will kill them, you have a ritual to take the cost instead. Uh, uh, but on top of this, you will need uh, reagents. You will need physical um, f ingredients to do it, and you will have the individuals that will act as the batteries to power and maintain and control how the ritual will flow to keep it stable and to keep it going, and so on and so forth. Now, earlier I mentioned about the arbitrariness of how um, intelligent undead and special undead are. This is because human beings can do a ritual to make themselves undead. It's an incredibly difficult one, and only two people have managed to do it. One of them became a lich, one of them became a vampire. The reason as to why it's arbitrary is because they are literally offering everything that makes them them unto death in order to grant a superior undeath. They're effectively giving away their life to become an undead. And they know full well that even if they are undead, they will still die eventually. That's the sacrifice. That's the thing. It's, they're not going to be guaranteed an eternal immortality. They, they acknowledge that in them sacrificing their life, they are effectively committing suicide. And what comes after that is what's left of them. And this is like the first time that this is done, um, with the first lich being made. Imagine yourself floating naked in a limbo and watching as your body rips itself apart. Your skin, organs, blood, everything flowing out of you slowly and then disappearing into dust as if being offered and accepted. It's kind of like that. The arbitrariness comes when death, because death is often seen as being a, as having a brilliant sense of humor. And you can see this with necromancers saving people's lives as you do. Um, because there's nothing, nothing like saving somebody's life when you're when you're practicing death magic. Yeah. So, um, death has a really sense of humor, and he will. He's a, he's essentially a huge troll, and it's often it's often said that he's a he, but it, it's more that people say he's a he. It's also people will say that he, it's a she. Some people say it's an it. It's like it, anything works more or less. Kind of kind of like with Christine God in the sense that some believe it's a male, some believe it's a female, some believe it's neither. It's yeah, like it's. Typically, it will be portrayed one way or the other, but nobody fully knows, and everybody will understand what you're referring to if you try to describe it. So, if you want to be an, an, an undead, something unique, something different, you will go for the ritual, you will offer your everything that you want to death, and death, being the troll that he is, will take the piss with it. For example, say, you're, say that you have a love of alcohol, and you turn yourself into a lich. You can't smell. You can't taste, you can see, you can touch, but you can't feel anything. You have no organs, um, so you can't drink alcohol. You can't experience that sensation, that feeling of swallowing something. You can't sleep. Um, you can cast magic, uh, but the problem with that is because you've got no organs to take the brunt of it, it instead goes to your mind as a form of incredibly advanced dementia until you forget everything about who you are and your you go effectively insane because you don't know who you are and you're scared. That's nuts. With vampirism, it's a bit different because with vampirism, uh, the person who did it was a prince and he had access to the artifact itself. He, he, whereas one, the lich did it through years upon years of study, self-education, experimentation. Um, this is the same. This is the same mad lad who used necromancy to uh, for agricultural purposes, wherein he would take the life from the crops to 
age them quicker to then uh, to then reap the harvest and they feed its family when drought was happening. Uh, so both of these are exceptions, not the norm. Because one's an incredibly intelligent, and despite and if he had better access to better stuff, he would have done a lot more than what he did. The other one's a prince who's a bit of an edge lord. Now the thing with the prince is because he he got a better deal from it because of his standing the the stuff that he had and the and he had access to the artifact itself which meant he got a much better result. On the same time though, with him being a vampire, death was being a troll to him. So you're okay. So how how did death go about this? Well, you're effectively a superhuman, but you're pale. Okay, you drink on blood. Why? Because fuck you. That's why you can't cross running water again. Because fuck you. And sunlight kills you. So you're a superhuman that can go at, su at superhuman speeds. You can f effectively um, uh, decapitate humans with a with a one handed weapon, not a blade. Like just because of how strong you are. You can do this. You can do this. You can you can make them more like you, but they will be weaker, and the, and every subsequent one that they make will be progressively weaker, so on and so forth. Um, but but despite you being a superhuman in this regard, you're only going to be out for what half half the year because of uh, sunlight. So good luck. It goes and it goes on like that. I really so like what you said about rituals. So death is very kind of fickle. He's very so it's. It, and the best thing about this as well is it's the belief of the people that that makes this how it is so it's not the case where in death is death is a concept it is a natural thing in, in life but it's the personification that the people themselves believe in and have done to make it how it is if they believed it to be completely different it would be completely different um, when it comes to the cost of magic it's the same universally as in um, if you use magic, there will be side effects. As in, if you're, it doesn't matter if you're healing somebody, it doesn't matter if you're raising the dead. The side effects will range depending on what you do and how much of it you are doing. So, dragons do have some leeway with this, um, but dragons, sorcerers, liches, vampires, like a lot of the special cases do have some leeway, but e but still the cost must be paid. And when it is paid, like with sorcerers, it, it can be a lot more excessive. And with dragons, it can just mean that they can't use magic for so long. Or like with vampires, it means that they can only do certain types of stuff or they can't do anything. And instead they have natural abilities that they can exploit or use, which will have their own limits and pros and cons. Sounds good, man. Um, I think I think that's about it. Um, there is some other stuff about the artifact and some lore reasons as to how it is, how it is, and what and it leading on to Lovecraftian type magic. But I've not fully developed that yet. So, any questions? Hmm. I'm trying to think. Uh, well, I've got a statement. I I really like how you describe rituals of something like you know. A single mage can't do it because it will kill him because it's too mm. much. Like the the cost is too large, but you can kind of spread it over multiple mages. Mm. I actually have some. I actually have some commissioned artwork of that I can send you later on. Um, oh, brilliant. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I really like so, that idea. So with how it so with how it'll be, and it's it will be different across different peoples. Like with uh, alchemists, for example, they will just simply draw the transportation circles, or like with werewolves, they will create the werewolf and then they will um, brand the circle onto the werewolf's chest, so that when the werewolf bites somebody, it will transmute that uh, that person into a lichen, so on and so forth. With necromancy, it's different because you're going to be using uh, graveyard salts, uh, which is an ingredient that is sp specific. And you're going to be making like uh, so. Imagine you got a big circle with little circles, as in not smaller circles from the big one. As in, in the big one, it will go along, and then there will be a circle. Tell you what, I've got a drawing. I'll just fucking send it. <laughs> All right. Uh, there it is. So, cause I'm trying to describe this, and I'm a bit, a bit spastic in that regard. So if you look in the podcast private, you can see it. Mm. So I've put bone marrow on that and yeah, we'll both work. You will have it wherein you'll have reagents, you'll have multiple people. It varies a lot. And because of how it works, you can ex there is a lot of way to exp of experimentation with it. But with this, the way to work is uh, you'll have like, 
you'll do first off it's the why you want to do a ritual and it'll be because the cost is too high or it'll be that what you want is too complicated to achieve by yourself effectively if any, if any of those requirements if any of those things are met as in you want to do something and you can't do it because of one or the other or maybe something else you do a ritual you will get other people in you will help they will help you so on and so forth the ritual will start by uh setting the ingredient that is making the circle itself on fire and it will start and it will burn uh a light will fill the room and it will begin flames will consume the reagents one by one and if accepted the effect will be played out uh with the people being the ones that you know control it and keep it going steadily and effectively sounds good okay man. i'll yeah. have to stop you there just because i need time to get through Ars Gothica's law which is very mm -hmm. interesting um mm -hmm. and if i will try to fill that in based on what i understand i asked him a few questions as well sure uh, should we explain about Ars Gothica to the people uh yeah, we're watching sure. So Ars Gothica is a modder and he's basically made Conan Exiles like a great necromancy game even before Funcon implemented their their own necromancy into the game. His mods were there and they're really good mods and he's got some very interesting ideas like lore based ideas about how the, the, the magic of his mods and stuff should work and like I asked him in, both in his uh, both in his mods where he uses I believe Conan lore and also his ideas about necromancy in general in the setting he's working on yeah so I'll try and explain this as best I can um, and with the stuff that I don't quite understand well like the um, the alchemy stuff maybe you can chime in seventh so yeah yeah Something Ars Gothica made very clear to me is that his setting is rooted in ancient mythology and he doesn't claim these ideas as his own, but rather the ideas of ancient people and what they believed. And the core of it is basically that a human has a soul and this soul is attached to the carnal corpse, which I take to mean your physical body. But the soul itself has a spirit which is attached to the astral corpse. And what happens when a human dies is that the soul detaches itself from the carnal corpse and the spirit detaches itself from the astral corpse. The spirit evolves and becomes immortal. And this is coming from a theme of the ancient Romans called apotheosis. And there's something here about the alchemical process of transforming lead into gold. If this doesn't work, then the spirit reincarnates. That's something I'm not clear on. I don't know what what's meant with that. Do you know, Seventh? Uh, can you repeat uh, exactly what you mean? He says, if the alchemical process of transforming lead into gold does not work, the yeah. spirit reincarnates. Uh, that part is basically about... Um more or less how should i say it? he made it way more complicated than it was originally but it's more or less like uh you know how there's reincarnation essentially um how with each iteration you're supposed to drive yourself kind of further uh toward uh the nirvana right toward reaching the higher states of consciousness uh so basically it's literally that it's like it's like you come back into the world uh if you aren't you know if you the lead of your soul isn't transmuted into gold you know so you may you may have this like the in in the in the uh, hindu religions where it's like each let's say iteration of the soul becomes more and more um spiritually enlightened so older souls that have had more incarnations have had more time to grow closer to nirvana etc etc so what he does is basically it, he, he kind of kind of separates the soul into like the spirit and the the astral corpse and i think um the real corpse and the soul it's it's complicated but but that's that's as far as i understood is that like um 
he believes in in a in a body that's spiritual and also divorced from from like a motive call a, a motive force in a way so like you can have like a spiritual thing that is dead that's how um ghosts are formed essentially is that is that ba- they're basically like they're basically like astral so like spiritual bodies without like will behind them if you know what i mean right so they're, they're like like spirits but they don't have the conscious intelligence so like the, this this kind of spark that is provided by the uh by the spirit at least that's that's what i understood of, of what he right what he Thank explains you for that so he goes on to describe what happens to the corpses and he says that the corpses decompose according to their respective dimensions like the laws of mm-hmm. that d- dimension so the physical corpse will rot away eaten by worms or whatever but for the um the astral corpse it's more complicated so basically the the astral corpse is affected by astral light which comes from the stars and the the root of the word is astrum which means star and this is somehow eating away at corpses and this astral corpse does not have its own consciousness but it's more of like a, a film or a recording of the person's conscious that's sort of imprinted there i think this is referring to like ghosts seem to be always doing the same action yeah. like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's like yeah it's it's uh, it's in a similar way how i describe the remnants of human emotions uh in my world retaining after uh after them even though the real soul is gone the the spirit the, the this, this kind of remnant thing can still be left after them that is more or less the same um situation here yeah and um he goes on to talk about the rest in peace and he says that normally a disembodied soul will rest in peace but it can be disrupted and what happens when a person does not rest in peace either by natural means like they're they're haunting for some reason or some kind of necromancer brings them back the soul will manifest itself as a ghost and the ghost relives its situations and memories as if it was dreaming and the ghost is a spiritless astral corpse the ghost has no conscious only the memory of what was imprinted upon them and for some reason the ghosts are threatened by a- by astral light so the, the the ghosts fear the astral light because it will destroy them they're unable to tap directly into life anymore so they so they devour the vitae of the living for strength I'm not sure how they would do this. Do you have an idea? I think uh, it's kind of the same way that Dementors work in uh, Harry Potter. It's like they, they like suck it off. Uh, uh-huh. suck, <laughs> suck it off. Uh, well, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> uh, they, 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 just, they just, yeah, they, they just suck out the, uh, the, the vital force. Um, of the person i assume yeah and basically this entire thing about ghosts and whatever it's rooted in the yeah. ancient legends of the romans and these romans called them lemurs which is really interesting because i was always wondering what a lemur was and now i know i thought you said memers then i was just thinking to myself wait what uh, this is this is some pretty nice law lemur or a lemur i'm not sure yeah. What's the more correct? Over here, we, we, we pronounce it as a lemur. Yeah. But, yeah. I have no idea. How would you say it in Latin? That's probably the correct way. Lemur as in the animal, or...? It's, it's spelt like... I'll just type it. It's spelt in the exact same way. I believe that it's... Uh, it may have a similar root. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go on to how the necromancy works in the setting, because in my opinion, this is the most interesting part. Basically, necromancy is defined by the laws of life and death. So it's not something 
sort of on the outside, it works within the existing system. And basically it's the ability to artificially create an event that naturally occurs in nature. And for this reason, necromancy is almost natural, but not quite due to its artificial sort of um, instantiation. So necromancy is basically an aberration tolerated by the universe. And he gave this really good example of how like a mole forms on like your skin. So a mole is kind of like, uh, it's almost like a cancer, but it's not something that's going to kill you. It can exist inside your system as a kind of strange tolerated aberration. And this is what necromancy is like to the universe. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just quick note that uh, no, um, yeah. <laughs> a skin mole is not tolerated, and a real cancer can come out of a skin mole. Can like a skin mole can develop potentially into an actual cancer that actually kills you. Yeah. Uh, See, when you're saying skin moles, I was just thinking of like a small it, it animal in your in your skin that just often. like, <laughs> but. The point, I think I know where he was getting at, but I think yeah. he, he used the wrong examples. Uh, the point of it was is, is that like normal things happen, uh, like destructive things happen, like disease happens and it has a purpose. So, so I think in the same way, he meant that like well you know disease happens and it's kind of like tolerated because it's like a a natural thing that occurs so what you're doing is like you're uh, by being a necromancer is like you're causing a, a disease to happen yeah uh, extra naturally in a way right exactly yeah and that's why he likes to describe a necromancer's work or necromancy as like a kind of cancer within life itself which is really awesome I think like it's a good description and that's all I've got for um, oh except for one other thing he mentions the philosophical salt connected to the body the philosophical sulfur connected to the soul and the philosophical mercury which is connected to the spirit and I'm not quite sure what these things are it sounds like alchemy stuff uh, the, the, the point of it was that like there's a mode of force um, but the thing is that alchemy is a how should i say it i don't want to say degenerative but like it it makes uh, essentially it explains things by by taking them apart right so it's like oh there's a a philosophical mercury that animates your soul which animates your body and, or, or there is philosophical sulfur, which, which, which animates your soul, which animates your body, or like um, you know, it, it takes things apart. Um, I want not to in say... a not in a fun degenerate way, but I mean, it, it's more like it takes the the um, that which we used to think as indivisive, or which I don't think there's a good reason to think as divided. divided. Um, like like a, like a soul you know or or human soul something like that as like divided so it's like oh well it's split into the the soul which is a motive force for the astral corpse the soul which is a motive force for the for the human body uh i mean the fleshy body and the something which is a motive force for the soul etc etc et say something um, I actually was going to say, are you sure on what you're saying there, Seventh? Because what uh, he said with the uh, mercury and all that are actual pre-existing alchemic uh, concepts. Because the yeah, mercury no, no, I, that's soul, true. That it is led true. to Azoth. That's true. Well, I cannot hear the word Azoth without thinking of Azoth from Lovecraft. I just, ugh. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. no, no. But, but from what I, what I was, what I was talking about is like. Um, the the ideas he takes um no sorry um what i meant is that uh alchemy takes uh the the concepts from 
more ancient things that at least as far as I understand more ancient things such as the 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 the, the idea of, of of a soul and then you know splits them into more things that's yeah. what I meant isn't uh, that that's all connected what, to yeah. some Greek guy that kept like hammering stuff smaller and smaller until he couldn't hammer it smaller anymore and he called that the atom or something <sighs> You know what I mean? That's no, ad- atomists aren't the start of. Uh, that was that was a different philosophical tradition oh, okay. for the atomists. Don't we, yeah. don't we do that yeah. with like processes and shit? We just like keep every year. We just keep getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. That's uh, that's the, the 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 thing about um, in a way reality, right? Is that you know a human is made out of breath and dust, and dust is like very fine material. Uh, I was going to say, does that explain how yeah. shit, uh, why humans are shit, in the sense that we're made out of shit materials? I mean, everything is made out of shit, out of fine <laughs> dust, you know, which comes together. Everything know, is dust. Et cetera, et cetera. Christ, yeah. imagine, imagine the magic system that had that. It's like, oh yeah, no, we, we don't use fucking, we don't use the powers of the warp, we don't use the powers from the aether. No, we, instead we just draw upon dust. We draw, we draw up on the atoms that make up everybody, and we just fuck with that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well um, yeah, sure. I think Endless uh, Legend does that. Anyone want to make any final closing points about anything we've discussed today? About necromancy magic. And also, I don't know if Negvia wants to discuss, yeah. discuss anything. He said he didn't have much in mind. Yeah. I don't really have too much going on for that. Just basically, like, the only thing that really came to mind while I was just kind of, like, discussing is all these things is basically maybe, like, uh, think more about, like, the, what, like, a standard spell or, like, what necrotic energy can be in, like, other scenarios. Like, um, the way I could say, like, a beginner necromancer just kind of starting off is basically just, like, learning just, like, raw necrotic energy and then learning how to, like, actually use it to invigorate, like, other, like, dead things. And so with that, like, um, if someone is being hit with like just raw necrotic energy blasts, it, it, it is weird. The fact like it's like this weird like strange um, energy, but I kind of just see it as like a false life force that can power the body. Problem is, if a person is already living, the raw uh, this like raw like necrotic I mean false life is trying to just replace the old and original life force until eventually you know withers away and just becomes like uh, just a husk. Um, but it cannot just outright control an undead body because it has to be more like a more specialization that the necromancer has to go and try to actually like uh, practice more with his own, um, you know, the, uh, the life force itself and practicing how to actually control things and move it with so with such. So hitting with something with animating undead life force won't do shit unless it's actually dead already. But hitting someone with raw undead life force can definitely just start causing some weird shit happen. That's I was going to say, imagine, about. imagine enchanting a weapon with life force, and when you hit somebody with that weapon, it just causes things to grow because it's putting life into the person. So it's like, oh yeah, you're going to grow a second head, you're going to get uh, pustules and oh, all kinds God. of stuff growing on you. It's like, oh yeah, now you've got two hearts, and now that's fucking your body up. Oh yeah, I mean, now, now mean, you've got skin on top of skin. I don't think um, life is necessarily growth. I I don't think cancer is life. But um, I don't think you can you can just explain it with life and death dichotomy, uh, because it is in a way an excess of life. You know, a cell can go into uh, necrotic state. You know, when it's used up essentially, when it's too old or damaged or something, it kills itself. And if it doesn't, if that mechanism for killing itself is broken somehow then it goes into the um into the uh neoplasia and etc into into cancer mm-hmm. but since these are closing statements um don't be cancer upon the world make interesting magic systems <laughs> yeah i agree i'm definitely going to incorporate some of your guys's ideas into my setting because i think you have great ideas Oh shit! Um, something. Uh, good, wait, can I can I say something? Yeah. Cheers. Something I want to say when it comes to uh, when it comes to necromancy magic. Um, 
if you're gonna go like soft magic or hard magic, if you're gonna do it in a sense wherein the magic will only be relevant to the story and you make it up as it goes along, or it's going to be one of those wherein it's more kind of not understood so much because it's not that important to the story. Or if something happens, it, like you can do that because when it comes to necromancy, life and death, it does get very philosophical. It does get very complicated very quickly, depending on how you do it. The same with that, if you do it in a hard magic way, in a sense wherein it has strict law, rules, limitations, and laws to it. Like, just, first and foremost, just have fun with it. You, when it comes to necromancy and media, it's not something that is so overly done. Like, you can go in a completely different direction with it, and it can work out very well. You could you could do it in a way that no one's ever done before, because with how necromancy is. Like, take World of Warcraft, for example. You've got Death Knights, you've got necromancers. How does any of that work? Oh, yeah, well, apparently we draw it from the Shadowlands, okay? But how does any of that work when it comes to plot? How does any of it make sense? Stuff like that. And that is still enjoyed by a lot of people. It scratches that itch. Yeah. So... Although, although in saying that, make sure that what you do is good. Make sure it makes sense. Make sure it make sure that it's one of those things where somebody can enjoy it if you're going to do it for other people, or you can enjoy it without as without stopping and thinking to yourself, "Wait a minute," because it's falling apart. This is like internal consistency, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also going on top of that as well, um, when it comes to necromancy, necromancy is typically mostly done in uh, medieval fantasy settings. An idea I, ha I have had a few times, and I would love for somebody to do, is a futuristic setting with um, necromantic robots. So, and this can go into the into very heavily into what robots you mean? Yeah, yeah, ne necrobots. So this can go heavily into what one deems living and what deems not living. But essentially, it's the idea that the <laughs> necrobots, <laughs> it's, it's robots with big necks. The issue I see with it is that generally speaking, once you get into sci-fi, robots and things just completely trump undead. Like, mm. they're just better in every way. Yeah, let's let's just leave this as a closing statement <laughs> I'll just, and I'll just, move I'll just on to other like, people's closing statements. Yeah, yeah, that's because I, I want somebody to do. I want somebody to do a glitch, a robotic glitch, a glitch. <laughs> somebody fucking do that for me, please. <laughs> All right, Mister Spook, you got any closing statements? Uh, not really. No, uh, I think I've said what I wanted to. All right, Negview, I guess you've said it. Yeah, that's pretty much me. All right. Thanks, everyone, for taking part. It's been really interesting. And Thank you very uh, much for having us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me as a guest. You're welcome. You can come on the next one if you want to. Um, all right. Bye, everyone. See you. See you.